Good evening. It is Wednesday night, February 3rd in the year 2021. We are moving forward in a year that we believe God is going to give some great blessings and open the doors to new opportunities to serve Him and to grow the body of Christ. At the same time, we are really excited how God used 2020 to make us 2021 Christians. So let's be it, let's do it as we move forward these days. If you always look to the website at calvaryassembly.church, you can find all the information you will need for what's happening that particular week, and of course then for the month and everything else, as well as our sermons. You can find your sermons. If you, if you watch online, obviously you know that you go there and, and, watch the, and, and click on the live button. If you don't often go there, maybe you didn't know that, but now you know, so praise the Lord for that. Hey, this coming Sunday is February 7th, and we'd like you to register to be here. Every Sunday is exciting. There's no Sunday that I can say is, oh, well, that was not a very exciting Sunday. So I can already say to you, this coming February 7th will be exciting. Will you go ahead right now and jump over to the register page, and would you register, you and your family, to be in the building? Or if you can't be here, then just to make a note that online, we will be online and we will participate and be on time, not show up 20 minutes or 30 minutes after the service starts. You know, these services are very tight. Uh, you know, they're, they're not going two hours. They're, they're somewhere in the hour range. So it's very important that we get every minute of it, as well as that on the second service this coming February 7th, we'll have a live children's church service downstairs these past weeks since we've started Children's Church again, and it's live, I'm really excited about the numbers of kids that are showing up. It's really wonderful, and parents, I'm so happy for you and for your kids. God bless. Wednesday night, we're all together, and here's where you are. We're together tonight. Can I encourage you to pray some for Wednesday night? You realize that the number of people that come or attend on Wednesday night is much less than comes on a Sunday morning? That gap, we need to ask God, And people who come on Wednesday night can pray and say, God, bring that gap much smaller. We want to see people who come to the house of God on a Wednesday night be involved with the body of Christ, or on a Sunday morning, rather, be involved with the body of Christ on a Wednesday night. Would you pray with me? That's that's a great prayer request that I have as a pastor. I ask you, especially as a Wednesday night person, to be praying for that. And then, of course, after this service will be our Royal Rangers mission and girls' ministries, encouraging you to send your kids there, as well as our Friday night youth, as well as our Sunday morning kids' church. We try and want our next generation to have a firm foundation in a crazy, crazy world. Hey, this very Saturday is Mops, our moms group. And can I encourage you to thankfully come, ladies, and come with the understanding that you want to be the best mother you can. And God has blessed you with that, that that calling. And yet it takes a lot of touching and helping from God. And so I'm encouraging you to be part of it even this Saturday. So we're talking like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, just just hardly just less than 72 hours from now, just all day Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So be here with us Saturday. And then tonight we're going to encourage you to give. Make sure that you are faithful in your giving. When you give, it opens the doors to blessings that, well, cannot be contained. And you know that the word blessing is not limited and should not be limited to finances. It can be many things. And so, God, I tithe so that, yes, he'll bless me financially, but far more, he will just bless me. Would you be blessed as you look to the Lord? Give of your tithe and offerings for missions tonight. Well, the title of our sermon tonight is... A Christian without hope. And Sister B is going to share with us, so let's transition over there right now. Well, thank you, Pastor. It always is a joy to be with fellow believers and to share the Word of God, to have the bread of life, to break it together. How blessed we are. Well, tonight I want to talk about being a Christian without hope have you and i ever said oh my hopelessness has washed over me like a tsunami 
Or maybe it, it, it's not engulfed your entire life, but you may say, you know, there's this one area of my life that, that I, I feel so hopeless in that area. It, it may be a, a habit that I'm trying to be an overcomer and I feel like it, it's hopeless. It's been too many years. Or maybe it's a person that you love that, that is, is, is captive to something that's destroying their lives and, and, and hopelessness has filled your heart. It could be a broken relationship. It could be a marriage. It could be anything. But that one facet of your life, hopelessness, wants to sneak in. But oh, tonight, did you know that a Christian without hope is an impossibility. It is impossible to be a Christian that has no hope. Why is that? Because the Bible tells us this. The Lord is my portion. If you look on my plate of life, there's not a little noodle there. There's not a few pennies. Oh, yes, I may be hopeless if that's my portion. But he said, no, no, no. The Lord is your portion. Therefore, we can hope in him. Do you know the day that you said yes to Jesus as your Savior? The one who saved me by his blood from the, both the penalty of my sin and the power of sin in my life. And then I not only took him as my Savior, but as my Lord. That when I do that, I enter a covenant relationship with God. And he then belongs to me. And I belong to him. He is my portion. This relationship we have is a covenant one. God is my portion. We cannot be without hope. Do you remember in his word in 1 Corinthians 13, where he tells us of three things that are constants in our new life. They are three necessary things for our soul. And the first one is faith. Yes, it's absolutely necessary in our walk with God to hear and believe his word. But secondly there, he also says that love is a necessary thing in our hearts as believers. But did you know sandwiched in between those two was hope? For the Christian life cannot have its completeness without all three of these. Why is hope so important? Well, we know that faith is because Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We know that love is important because we know God's word. It says, whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. But hope, why is hope a necessary component of our new life in Christ. Why? Well, the first reason is this. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 6, 19, that hope is an anchor for my soul. When the storm is raging on the ocean of my life, the truth that it is impossible possible for God to lie and that his word or his counsel is 
immutable. It is unchangeable. No one can step above him and change it. This, this promise holds us steady. Our hope in the immutable word of God is the anchor, he said, for our soul. Hope is important. It will keep us during those times when we don't know what to do and the storm would seek to, to, to send me places I, I don't want to go. My hopeless despair wants to, wants to cause me to drift who knows where. But God says hope in him is the anchor for my soul, very important. But secondly, in Romans 5, 5, he tells us that hope is so necessary because it keeps us from being ashamed. And he explains it to us there. He says that as Christians, because we're in covenant with God, we don't have to be afraid of tribulations troubles, difficulties. Jesus said, oh, in this world you are going to have them, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm bigger than them all. But he said, so we as Christians can rejoice even in tribulations because we know that tribulation works something in our life called patience. That we're not just going to quit Throw the towel over every little bump in the road. I quit. I'm not going to bother. No, no. It works patience in our lives. And he says, and patience works in us experience. Our patience to continue on begins to put experience under our belt. We say, oh, I'm not worried about this. I remember God's faithfulness last time. Oh, yeah, I went through a fire like this some time ago, but God was faithful. Oh, his grace will be enough. It was last time. Yes, experience puts, puts uh, um, um, no, patience in our tribulations, puts experience under our belt. And experience gives us hope. It causes us to be Christians with a steady hope. We say, no, 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 I am not in despair. Yes, I'm going through a tribulation. But you know, I have some experience that came from my patient endurance those other times. And so now I know, though I cannot see, I can hope in the Lord. And he said, because of that, this hope keeps us from being ashamed because we trust that love of our covenant God. This hope keeps us from quitting the race, from turning back, from accusing God of things that later we will be ashamed. Yes, hope keeps us from being ashamed, from disappointing ourselves. But thirdly, the Bible tells us that hope in God is so important because it determines the health of my countenance. Yes, when I step into the world, it can be a workplace. It can be the, the teller at the bank. It can be the girl at the checkout in the grocery store or a neighbor we speak to over the fence. But the world would determine the, my hope or my lack of it by the health of my countenance. Does my countenance betray the hopeless despair of my heart. 
Do my watching children conclude that maybe God isn't enough after all? Yes, my steadfast hope in God is the health of my countenance, for my faith mirrors the hope that is in my heart. <clears throat> Hope is important. Yes, it's the anchor of my soul. It keeps me from sinning against God and being ashamed. And it keeps God's joy on my face as a steady testimony of my hope in him. So here is the question then. How does one put their hope in the Lord. It is important. But how do I do that? God's word tells us in Romans 15, 4. We, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, will have hope. Listen to what this, it says from the beginning. It said, whatever things were written before, just think, God took time. God made ways. God planted, pl planned. God anointed his prophets with his spirit that his word could be written down. Oh, it's so precious. And it says in Romans 15, 4, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. We're to learn this living word of God. So that through the patience, patience, oh yes, letting God bring his word to pass in his own time, that through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. Did you know that it was through the scriptures that Jesus brought hope to the distraught and despairing disciples that were leaving Jerusalem after a horrific weekend of watching their Messiah, the one they believed would be their Savior, their Messiah, for which they had waited for long. You see, he could raise the dead. He could cast out demons. He could calm the storm on the ocean. He could multiply bread. He could heal every sickness and disease. And then he was nailed to a Roman cross. And it was as though God stood by hopeless and helplessly and did nothing. And they were full of hopelessness. How was their hope restored? For they were God's people. The Bible says that Jesus came up and began to walk beside them. And he didn't say to them, oh, I'm here, don't be sad. Look it, it's me, I, don't be upset. Oh, no. The Bible says that Jesus, in Luke 24, verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Yes, Jesus opened to them the scriptures, starting all the way back at Moses and down through the prophets. And suddenly, to their hopeless, despairing hearts, it all began to make sense. The scriptures that God had planned and spoken long ago were only fulfilled. Oh, those events of the weekend 
were not happenstance. They were no occasion for despair. They were the stepping stones of God's perfect purposes. Yes, the prophets of old were simple, humble men, but God gave his word to them. His word to them is the scriptures, the powerful, changeless word of the Almighty God. 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds us, all scripture is God-breathed. It is through patience and the comfort of the scriptures that you and I have hope, our hope renewed. So I want to ask you, when you are in despair, do you turn to his word? Oh, how wise we are to meditate on the scriptures as we go to sleep, trusting ourselves in a shaky world to the changeless promises of God. Oh, how wise we are to meditate on his changeless word, those scriptures, when the storm clouds are black and we can see nothing. For then we can walk by faith, by hearing him and not by sight. Oh, how wise we are to meditate on his changeless truth, the scriptures. When the lies of the wicked send our Joseph to a prison cell. God's word is still true. Romans 8, 28 is his word that says, We know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his word. Oh, how wise we are to meditate on the scriptures, his changeless word, when, like the Syrophoenician woman, we are crying to him, but for some reason, he is not answering a word to us. It is through patience and the comfort of the scriptures what God has already said, his changeless word, we might have hope. The powerful word of God gives us hope. Psalm 119, verse 49 and 50 says, Remember the word unto your servant, upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has quickened me. Quicken is the old English word for giving life to something. Isn't it quite a wonder for all that we've invented, for all the knowledge that we've discovered in today's world, we cannot produce life. Still, God alone is the life giver. And he says that his word is a living word and it will put his life into it, into us. It will quicken us. His word causes us to hope. Do you sit down with his word when despair is knocking at your door? Do you let God remind you of his promise? Do you pick up your daily light, open it up, and let the truth of our almighty God restore your hope? It is his way, and it is precious. For Romans 15, 13 says, now may the God of hope, that's what he calls himself, Fill you with all joy and peace. Those are the antonyms of despair, of hopelessness. 
Oh, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you can abound in hope. Yes, the changeless word of God causes you and I to have a steady hope. Let you and I remember when we're tempted with hopelessness or despair, not to think of other ways to have it restored. Let, let, let's run away. Let's move somewhere. Let's, let's, let's get distracted. No, because when we return to reality, oh, our hopes are dashed again. God's word, our trust in it, will cause us to have a steady hope. Are there challenges, though, to our hope in the Lord? Oh, there are. There are. Let's look at three of them. The first one is time. As we wait for God can be a challenge to our hope. Have you been trusting God? for what seems to you like a very long time for that thing that you have put your hope in him? Genesis 12, verses 1 through 5, tell us of 75-year-old Abraham and his wife Sarah who were childless. And yet the word of God came to them and God told Abraham that he would make him the father of of many nations. Abraham believed God and put his hope in God's word. And time passed. And more time passed. And more time passed after that. Time was a challenge to Abraham's hope. But in Hebrews, uh, not in Hebrews, in Romans, the fourth chapter and verse 18, it tells us that Abraham, who, contrary to hope, in other words, there was no reason for him to hope because now he was very old and Sarah's womb had been dead a long time. But against all impossibilities in hope, he believed God so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken to him. That changeless word of God where God had said to him, do you see the stars, Abraham? Go ahead and count them. That's how many descendants you will have. Don't let time alter your hope in God's word to you. Give him time to work his perfect plan. Stay in the place of faith, believing God. But secondly, sometimes adversity can be a challenge to our hope. Adversity. You remember Jesus told the parable about the seed that was sown in, in, in hearts. And he said, yes, that seed of faith was sown, but when adversity came and trouble came, the person said, well, forget it. And that seed of faith in God's word never brought to pass that, that plan and purpose of God. Yes, adversity can be a challenge to our hope. Do you remember when God sent Moses back to Egypt and told him to go and deliver his people from Pharaoh's slavery? And do you remember that Moses went and did and said exactly what God had told him to he was so hopeful. And then Pharaoh said, no, 
a flat out no. Was Moses discouraged? <laughs> yes, he was. For Exodus, the fifth chapter in verses 22 and 23, we find Moses saying to God, why did you send me? For you have not delivered your people at all. Adversity can be a challenge to our hope. But Moses did a wise thing. He went back to God and allowed God to speak to his heart again, his word. And sure enough, God said to Moses, when I am done with all of Pharaoh's no's, no, 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 he said he will thrust you out of Egypt and all my judgments by then will have fallen on his land for all the evil that he has done to my people. When adversity is a challenge to our hope, we need to go back and hear what God says again that we may firmly hold on to his word, for it will come to pass. But thirdly, impossibilities can be a challenge as we put our hope in the Lord. In Mark chapter 5, do you remember that Jairus, the ruler, had come to Jesus because his daughter was very ill? And Jesus had given him his word that he would go to his house and heal her. And Jairus had put his hope in Jesus' word. And then the messengers came. The messengers of despair and hopelessness because they said to Jairus as they came in and, and, and got off their horses and, and ran over to Jairus and said, Jairus, don't bother Jesus anymore. It's hopeless. Your daughter died. Now it's impossible. But do you remember what Jesus did? He turned to Jairus and he spoke his word again. And he said to him, don't be afraid, only believe. Did Jairus turn away in despair and say, forget it, forget it? Was he swallowed up by the impossibilities of the moment? No, he chose, he chose to place his hope in Jesus' word. And his daughter was raised from the dead. Have, has your hope been dashed by a new setback that now uh, makes the situation more impossible than ever? Oh, to God, it's no setback at all. Put his hope in his word. You remember he says in Romans 4, 17, God gives life to what is dead. The most hopeless thing, God, brings life. And God calls those things that aren't even in existence as though they were because he has spoken of them in the days to come. No wonder. We are to hope in his word, for there are no impossibilities with God. In closing, I want you to look with me at Jeremiah 17 and verse 7. It says, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. The Lord is his portion. That's where his hope comes from. And he says, do you know what this person who places their hope in the Lord, who allows their heart to trust in him? Why, he said he's going to be like a tree planted by 
rivers of water that spreads out her roots to those waters. Why, it says, because of, by his roots he has a place to draw from, a steady thing from which to draw, a ceaseless source. And he says, do you know what? He won't fear when heat comes so hot, so many difficulties. He's fearless because his roots are drawing from the ceaseless water supply. Secondly, it says, his leaf will remain green. Yes, his countenance will be healthy. He won't wither with despair. Oh, thirdly, it says, why, he won't even be anxious in the year of drought. A whole year of drought with nothing we can see that would bring us hope. Ah, our roots are drawing our hope from the rivers of our God. And fourthly, it says, and he will never stop yielding fruit. He will remain a fruitful believer because his roots are drinking from the supply of God's living hope. Yes, are you drawing your hope only from the Lord? Are we Christians without hope? No, it can't be because the Lord, the Almighty God is my portion and my hope is in him. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you that you've not only given us faith as a thing that our soul needs and love, oh God, is so necessary, but you know that hope is also necessary for our soul. And you, have, you know that this world offers little hope that it only offers hope that comes and goes with, with every little wind of adversity or change. But you've told us that blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. Father, it is through the patience and the comfort of your scriptures, Father, that we can have hope and how we thank you for your changeless word, that you are our changeless covenant God and we can be a people with hope, ready at any time to give an answer for the reason of the steady hope of God that dwells in us. We praise you and thank you, our Father. In Jesus' name, amen.